Welcome, welcome, welcome to the new episode of We Beat Air. This is episode seven, so uh, it's uh, lucky seven, lucky for you, because we have a special guest uh, in the studio with us. Uh, it's uh, in the studio, well, it's like, well, in the air, somewhere. Uh, we have Veronica from the We Beat Cloud Services team, which is uh, amazing, and the usual suspect uh, from uh, the Devro team, Dan, Erica, and Zen. So uh, hello, everyone. And uh, I also brought in just for today's call, uh, these two guys, so these are my meerkats. Uh, the, the skinny guy is also a meerkat, by the way. Uh, it was a gift that, that Dan brought from uh, South Africa, which is kind of cool. So it's uh, really, really cool. So thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, we really, really appreciate um, your time that you spend with us. Uh, so, so it's really, really good. Um, if you want to help this, uh, this channel, uh, give the video a like, uh, whether you watch it live or later on, you know, like uh, time is, uh, is an interesting concept, right? Like this is happening live and yet you will be able to watch it years from now, uh, which is really cool. Um, and then the best thing about actually being live is the ability to ask questions. So please feel free to ask questions as we go. I'll try to monitor the questions. Sometimes people answer them like uh, directly on the YouTube channel, uh, but, but we'll also try to address them and then sh I'll share them with everybody else. So, that's it about like the, the usual uh, intro. And then we have four topics that we'd like to cover today. So the first topic that we will talk about is discuss or actually how can you share your feedback with us directly on the WV8 website, which is really cool. So Dan will talk to you about that. Um, the next thing that we have, and that's why we have Veronica here, uh, is what's new in the Vivid Cloud Services. Like uh, you, maybe we get some secrets from one of the engineers that was building it. So this is really cool. No pressure, Vera. It's going to be great for sure. Um, there's also a lot of things happening. Oh, this is a new uh, graphic that we have. Uh, a, a lot of things happening around like the chat GPT retrieval plugins. And then there is our plugins in general. So Zen will talk to you about the, the plugin that works uh, with WV8. Uh, I'm sure he'll be able to explain it way better than I do. Uh, and then finally, last but not least, there's been so much excitement around AutoGPT. Uh, and then actually you can use AutoGPT with WV8 and Erica is going to cover that for us. And of course, we'll all have a nice chat about it and then uh, have some questions. So feel free. Uh, to drop questions and also as a as a second thing is like just drop us a message just for a warm up say hey where are you watching from you know like or like is this the first uh, episode that you're watching I, is this like a second or a third heck if you saw all seven i'll send you a, a t-shirt like you can lie i will not have a way to, to 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 test but the first person to say it maybe will get a t-shirt you know and um erica yeah you know the first comment yeah Thanks for joining. Uh, you already have a t-shirt, so that would be cheating, but um, maybe I'll send you one special. I've attended all seven, so. <laughs> you attended all seven, right? Like you're a real pro. Um, so really, really great. So that's it for the warm up. Let's dive into um, discuss. So Dan, what can you tell us about it? Cause like you worked on it um and uh it's actually a pretty cool project and um i, I feel like uh, people really enjoy uh, learning about it yes hi everyone um so giscas is a uh, commenting widget and the motivation was to give developers an easy way to interact with our documentation to give us a thumbs up or some uh, feedback or ask clarification questions and so far, the way you do that, you'd have to go to GitHub, uh, find our project, and file an issue. But um, let's say you read the blog post and have a question about uh, AutoGPT. You can simply type it in this uh, comment widget down here. You don't have to go to GitHub. You don't have to find the correct product. It's right there. So. Um, these comments pertain to the blog or to our documentation. For instance, let's say uh, you want to check out the new embedded WV8 feature that we launched recently. And while reading the documentation, you realize that we don't talk about modules. So you can leave a comment, something like, uh, what modules are enabled by default? And um, I'm logging to GitHub, so I see this comment button. 
If you are commenting for the first time, you're going to see a button to sign in with GitHub. Once you authorize that, your comment will post. And uh, comments end up in the weviate.io IO repo in the discussion tab. And um, I've refreshed the page and you see it here. There was a doc comment on the embedded VVA page. And um, everything is done through GitHub, so your identity will be preserved there. You can see this was my username, and um, this is a comment I left. And if you simply want to express your appreciation for the fantastic job that we've been doing on this, you can also give us a heart or even say that the page rocks. And that will also be reflected right here on uh, in the GitHub uh, discussion. So the way we built this was um, initially we looked at um, popular commenting widgets. One of them was uh, Discuss. They all love this portmanteau between discussion and something. Um, but it, this has, um, Discuss was not open source and uh, it also tracks users. So we looked at open source options and found uh, Discuss, which is um, project that uh, is building a comment system powered by GitHub discussions, what we saw earlier. So um, this has advantage that it's all open source and it's stored on GitHub along with uh, our code and the issues. You can uh, link to issue numbers and you can create an issue out of a discussion. So we are going to do that when we triage comments. And uh, it's a easy to export anything if we ever want to move to a different system in the future, thanks to the GitHub APIs. And um, it's a really useful discussion system that uh, you may be interested in adopting for your own open source project. Uh, pretty easy to get started with. Uh, we made a few customization to have um, both the name here and the path, because sometimes the name can be ambiguous, like installation, but the path is ambiguated. But uh, essentially, it was a pretty straightforward integration. So yeah, we welcome your comments on uh, both blog posts or the documentation. Just scroll to the bottom and uh, give us uh, some nice emojis or some constructive feedback. Excellent, excellent. Um, I mean, it's always like, I love like when you are like, yeah, give us feedback, but not just feedback, make it constructive, right? Like uh, be nice about it. Like even if something is, uh, you know, needs a bit of change and help, like uh, be constructive. But I would definitely encourage everyone else to, to kind of like check it out. Um, and, and also I know, and I think Dan is about to show it, for every blog post that we have, uh, we also have discussions at the bottom. So if you read one of the blog posts or all of them, like, uh, like you should, um, and you find it interesting or you have like some question, follow, follow up questions, uh, that could be a pretty cool place to, to do that. And uh, the latest blog post already got some likes, etc. cetera. So that, that's really, really cool to that see. That was not staged, actually. I, let's see who these people were. Oh, OK. You have uh, Connor, Etienne. And John. Mm. It's John, yeah. John, yeah. So like, yeah, let's let's get some uh, emojis and uh, from from the community. Like, uh, is uh, right now there's 15 people I can see watching. So uh, why not, right? I'm curious, um, and maybe I can stop sharing your screen for now. Um, how long did you take to implement that? Like, what was like um, from the moment you knew it's going to be discussed? Like, uh, how long did you take for that? Um, in terms of uh, absolute hours. I don't know, something like four, I would say. But it was much more difficult to do the market research for this and um, see what implications discuss has versus discuss. Uh, so I would say four plus um, a few more for testing and debugging. And um, there are a few points that um, don't work that well. If you only leave an emoji, we still say documentation comment on that page. There's actually, there's no comment that address the emojis. So I, I've been trying to tweak that, but I don't have a good solution so far. Um, we might have in the future something like reactions on the post as opposed to comments on it. Nice, nice. But this is the thing, right? Like if, uh, if people in the audience see this and like we've already done the research and uh, if you like what, what you have, like, uh, yeah, you could, you could get it done in like half a day, maybe a day. 
Uh, that's pretty that's impressive. Time, yeah, that it takes to integrate this. Uh, the, the, of course, we did an internal testing and so how we interact with it and all that. But um, now that you know it's uh, it's a good uh, widget to adopt, you can uh, do it much faster than we did. Excellent. Yeah, excellent. I think I think for me, what this improves a lot is the workflow on feedback for uh, blogs and documentation. Mm -hmm. So after I wrote that um, ChatGPT plugin blog, I got emails, Twitter responses, people reached out on the Slack channel. So there's like a thousand different channels that you can ask questions, but the most relevant one now would just be Giscus because I would be following that and we can have a conversation there. You can, of course, email me and reach out to me through whatever channel, but this would be, I would be watching out for questions there. So my response rate would be very high on Giscus. So now we have like one central channel for questions, feedback, everything related to a blog post. Can you add people in the comments? Uh, so you can do that. Um, if I want to share the screen, I can show how that works. You can, you can do that on GitHub, but um, so in here you are in GitHub discussions and you can say Sebastian please answer this. Um, but uh, no. in here, uh, there's no auto completion. And that, uh, that's a limitation of um, the uh, plugin. So to expand a bit more on the implementation, uh, this is uh, the web component. And then there is a Giscas React component that we used. And that made it um, easier to implement once. Uh, we found out about it and the bulk of the work so i didn't include this in the four hours the bulk was to actually go through each page of our site and make sure the footer had a reference to this widget because we have different types of blog posts and different footers some of them are called to action hey use weviate others are stay in touch depends on the context so um it's not uh, impossible that most of the work would be actually to just place the widget in your footer if that's not a uniform piece of content. Nice, nice. Cool. No questions. So now it's a shout out time. So, you know, at the beginning, I asked uh, our audience like uh, where people are watching uh, from. And uh, so we have Brent from Canada, Ottawa. So, uh, Zen, uh, maybe uh, not not too far off. Although Canada is so huge, it's probably far far enough. Um, then uh, you have Deep. We have Deep from London. Uh, we have Sila from Netherlands. Uh, Zen, you're already uh, hand waving. Uh, and then uh, we have Virenda from in uh, Indiana, USA. And then we have Marco from Milan. So. Uh, Welcome everyone to Weavid Air. We are super ha happy to have you here. And uh, hopefully just this shout out alone was enough. Hey, and uh, we have someone from uh, Lisbon, Portugal, Otman. Um, FYI, Portugal is my, one of my favorite countries in Europe. Uh, so like definitely uh, uh, excited to see somebody from Lisbon and uh, any excuse to go there, by the way, it's, uh, it's a good thing for me. So maybe I should go and meet Otman. That would be cool. Um, I'm trying to hide the, the banner, but it's not hiding. Maybe it's just not showing for me. There we go. There's a delay. All right. So perfect. So that's uh, that's part number one. Now we have Veronica that will talk to us about WCS. Vera, should I share your screen? Uh, yes, please. All right. So. All right. Um... So I'm already logged in. Uh, this is our new WCS. Um, we launched it around three weeks ago. Uh, so what I prepared for you today is the um, sandbox, which is the free sandbox. It's a free cluster. Uh, and uh, you, you, ha you have 14 days to use that. And you can see here some details like URL, the Weavit version, uh, information about API keys and uh, expiration date, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the next two are about uh, the paid clusters with the standard plan. So one which I prepared for you is the one with the lower Weavit version. About that in a second, or maybe 
we will go through it right now because we need a couple of minutes um, to uh, wait for the update. So here, uh, let's say that the we v8 deployed cool new features and i really really would, would like to use them uh, so uh, we prepared the solution that it's just one click now and you have to provide the cluster name and just click confirm what is happening now we have heard here the notification that it's starting and here you go uh, you cannot delete the cluster because it's in a progression state on or query it because this is the version without the high availability. And uh, after a couple of minutes, you will see that the Weavit version is the uh, uh, newest one. And while we are talking about that, the newest version is 1.18.3 and uh, it enables some uh, cool features for our users about that in a second. Um, Hey so Vera, this is amazing. <laughs> this this is actually amazing because like uh, sometimes uh, like especially when we have like a new release of Weaviate, right? And uh, <laughs> I always kind of go like uh, yeah, like uh, but I really want to straight up like start using this. And then sometimes in the past I would just go like hey, I'll, I'll create a new version and then make, migrate my data over. But now I could just click the button, wait for a few minutes, uh, and then I can start using whatever is latest and greatest. So uh, this yeah. is amazing. I didn't know we could do that. Exactly. Uh, just like that. <laughs> One click and the other. So the magic is happening. Underneath, we are already 50%. So that's why we are slowly uh, move to the next topic in the meantime, which is uh, the API keys management. Um, so lots of users, they were um, re they requesting um, that uh, it would be really great if we have some API keys to have access to the cluster. Uh, of course, this is a great idea because uh, based on this example, for, for uh, um, I can tell you that this is the sandbox, so the free cluster. And I during the creation, so let's go maybe just to create a cluster. So I pick the free sandbox and this is the, uh, the authentication is enabled by default, which is always great to have one. Um, so let's go back because I wanted just to show you that we have such option. Oh, oh and we have to take a pause because like you can see the uh, Weavit version update is already done. It was uh, quicker than I thought. <laughs> so that's, that's nice. Wow, that was so easy. Yeah, so easy and, and fast. I, I thought that I have more time. <laughs> uh, so we have already here the newest version and uh, we can just uh, use our cluster and query it and fit with, with new cool data. So uh, once we go to the sandbox, which is the API uh, keys management, we can see that I enabled the authentication during the um, when I was clicking on the form. And by clicking on a key, I see Oh, okay, I can see I have my API keys. I have the admin key. I can uh, see the example header, which I can copy and use that. Uh, for example, I would like to share my cluster with uh, with uh, you, Sebastian, and but I don't want to give you my credentials to WCS. So now you can query the, the cluster because I will share with you the URL of the cluster and the API key. And we will go there in uh, two minutes because uh, there is more about API keys. Uh, so now we released a uh, couple of days ago the, uh, the new cool feature, which is the managed API keys. It means uh, you can add or remove existing keys Mm, it's also really easy. So let's go and add a new API key. Could be read only so um, um, on the access to read the data or full admin access. We can go maybe with the read only one, generate. And we can see that uh, the process started. It's already uh, in progress. It takes a couple of minutes. And uh, while talking about that, let's go to the another cluster and maybe just remove some keys because uh, I don't want to use this key anymore because I think that this is not uh, in a usage and it's better to have always uh, only the, the keys we are using. And that's it, it's already removed. 
and the two, for those two clusters, action is in progress, of course. Uh, it takes a couple of minutes again, uh, but uh, you can do it you no, know, on your own. You don't have to ask anyone. You don't have to find anything. This is just a click, and it's easy. And I think it's really fast and will be helpful for our users. Uh, oh, we have fifty percent already. All right. Nice. That's cool. Yeah. Hey, uh, so I have a question or and a comment, right? So first mm -hmm. of all, uh, I think you'll be one of the first people that would want uh, uh, ability to delete the keys. Because like right now, like let's say you compromise your clusters because you share the, cl the the keys with the world. Exactly. Like the all exactly. 700 people that are watching us live, that's a real number, uh, are now probably <laughs> copying, trying to hack in into our, our, our environment. And that's kind of uh, really mm -hmm. useful, right? Because if yes. let's say by mistake, you committed your key to GitHub repo or you showed it on a super popular Vivid Air, uh, you could just delete it and then like nobody can get access to it. Um, but I also really love the ability to split the read and write keys. Uh, because let's say if for backend operations, you have the write key for uh, mod for modifying the data, etc. But if you want to build a website then later on that uses Weebly to search, you should only ever use read key, right? Um, yes. So that's really, really exactly. cool. Yeah, I'm exactly. very excited about this. <laughs> and uh, I already used the keys before, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that you could actually change the keys and generate new ones. That's really cool. Yeah, that's uh, our uh, the newest feature. So let's see what we've got here. So yeah, we have one more key uh, already added uh, to our cluster. And here I was removing one, right? So I don't mm -hmm. know if it's, yeah, I removed one uh, of the read-only keys and it's removed. Uh, but the operation is not uh, finished yet, but no problem. It will be done a couple of minutes. Uh, of course, I will remove all data I prefer for you guys today. <laughs> this is, of course, the, the thing. I don't want to pay for all of those clusters. <laughs> all right, what do you mean? Cool. Weave it is cheap, you know? Yeah, I know. I know. Oh, it's um, very good price. All right. So one more thing, maybe let's, um, because I know that we have lots of users that they have already clusters which are deployed, uh, not by us, uh, but um, they are somewhere in a cool place. So we, you can add this cluster here in the external cluster section and just query it in a query module. So as a test, let's uh, type data set for example, cluster, and I have prepared, of course, something for you. So the URL, save, and uh, doing that, we can go to the query module. And as a locked in user, I can see all clusters. So the managed clusters and the sandboxes, um, and I can easily query them. So this is the um, one I prepared with, with data. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, so the query cannot be empty, of course. So let's go there and see what we have there. Some for sure pretty basic example, but I would like to show you that, that it's working. Uh, and so I'm uh, a logged in custom uh, user here. So we can see that, yeah, okay, I can access the data, everything is fine. But in a case we were discussing before, so what in a case that uh, I would like to, uh, someone would like to see the data, but not uh, change the data, of course. And uh, I don't want to share my credentials to WCS. Uh, so let's just log out and we can see the start screen. So let's go there and uh, use the same cluster we were querying now. So I'm pretending I'm the different person, the new team member. So uh, I have to paste the cluster URL and uh, Sebastian, mm, uh, of course, name, urban cluster and click connect. We are in a, uh, we are in a uh, query module. So here in the beginning, we didn't support the external cluster querying, but now we are. So you have two options because you can be logged in and just class, uh, query your cluster, or you can do the thing we were discussing before. So now we can see we are unauthorized, right? Because I'm logged out and I didn't use the um, authorization header. So now let's go and just add it. 
And this is the same cluster I was using when I was logged in. So we need the key authorization. Now let's place the read only key API key, which is like that. Click again. And like you can see again, I have a I have an access to the cluster and I can query. This is so amazing. Um, Erica was actually clapping. She was so excited about it. This is so awesome. Wow. Yeah. So that would be it from my side, what I wanted to show you today. Uh, and thank you. Perfect. This is a great uh, presentation. Anybody else have questions before I ask some more? <laughs> Wait, Maybe from the audience as well, but they're in here. I don't have a question, but I was talking to... Um... So there was a someone uh, new to WeV8 who was interested in this. And um, all I did was send them a link to WCS. And the next email I had with them was, how do I upload in, uh, documents to my WeV8 cluster? Like the whole process is so seamless and straightforward that I didn't have multiple interactions. Oh, this is not working. How do I do this? It was literally send them a link and then they want to see how I can how they can upload documents to it from that point on. So this is great. Nice, nice. And we have a nice comment from Brent. Thank you, Brent. Um, yeah. Vera, if you are on the free tier, can you also update your instance? Even though, I mean, I guess, like if you're creating a cluster around the same time that there's a release? Uh, uh, no, no. Um, for now, we don't have a feature for Sandbox to be updated. Uh, but when there is a plan to have one, we'll have one. But as I know, uh, now there is no... Uh, plans for that and uh, sandboxes are now only valid for 14 days so maybe maybe that's that's the reason as well yeah. <laughs> so yeah there shouldn't be too many version changes right in those 14 days i don't know um, Eddie, it's on here <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah at, at, at yeah. has has a might have a different idea but yeah sure um, <laughs> be useful um, and then also, mm. since our CTO is here, he's dropped the comment. Um, like, yeah, it's actually, he's so right. Just a few months ago, it was a bunch of mockups. Like we had like the old WCS, but the new one, it's so great to see it then. And I agree with it, Etienne, amazing demo, Vera. I know you are a bit nervous before, but like, hey, yeah, yeah no reasons to be nervous whatsoever. You did great. Um, Thank you. Questions, anyone else? Um, also, uh, sorry, Dan, you go. I had another question about the free tier, like you, Erika. Um, the uh, read-only API key that's only available for the... Um, it's not available for the free tier, right? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, there is one, one key available. I think this is the admin one. Uh, but we cannot... We, wait, we cannot uh, change it or, you know, uh, delete or add a new one for now uh, for the free cluster. Let's just take a look. Yeah, you you um, you have just the one default one during the creation process. Right, there's no read only key or a key there. Yes. Well, you should upgrade anybody who wants a read only key. That's a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there is a need. There will be read only need, <laughs> read only key. <laughs> Another way is like share your feedback with us, right? And uh, tell us. Uh, so that would definitely definitely work. Um, just before you, sure. I give the floor to Erica, we have another comment. Mm -hmm. Very impressive from Brad. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Keep the comments uh, coming, everyone. That's great. Also, there will be a tutorial and blog post on authorization. So um, Vera touched on it, um, and she showed all the cool new capabilities. But next week, we'll be releasing something that can also help further help uh, the community users. Yeah. And about that, maybe we can al already um, say that the feature about the updating cluster is pretty neat because with the version uh, 1.18.3, you can use the OpenAI um, uh, API key in the query module. So because we wait accepts that. So I think that it's really great information for our users. Nice. Very cool. I have another question from the community, but I'm not sure if that's like a, for us to handle. Maybe something, I mean, does anyone know here or maybe something at the end could help with? Do we know, is there a plan to download models like with the self-hosted Docker or 
states, uh, for instance, to get clip. I don't think that's part of uh, what we are supposed to do with WCS, right? Yeah. Maybe we should go pray to uh, the mighty Etienne who's uh, watching the session. Uh, maybe yeah. <laughs> uh, respond on the comments because uh, I don't think any of us know the answer to that. Um, right. Question from Brad Is the cloud mm -hmm. service running on AWS? All right. Uh, so our service is running on uh, Google Cloud, uh, but uh, if we are talking about clusters, it's coming uh, soon. So you can deploy then your cluster in the WCS or, or in a, a AWS, I'm sorry, or Google Cloud, or maybe in the future, for sure in the future Azure Cloud. And based on that, there will be more and more configuration that it's uh, that the user gets uh, really the, you know, the, the cluster he or she needs. Perfect. And I also know like in between like a self-hosted and like using WCS, we are, we also have like a, uh, the hybrid model. So if you have mm -hmm. like your own, like a set of uh, private VPN or other clusters, and then you want Viviate, uh, like uh, connect with Viviate cloud services, we can offer that. So we can help uh, help with uh, establishing it uh, and then uh, do the whole like uh, hosting uh, within your own environment. Uh, so that's like also like, it could be very useful for like government organizations maybe where you go like, hey, this has to exist on our uh, clouds, uh, and then you can't go anywhere else. So that's definitely an option. Yeah. And uh, to your uh, response, this cloud service will be an easy sell for me now. Oh. <laughs> we are glad we converted you, Brad. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Any final comments before we move on to Zen? All right, no comments. So thank you, Vera. And there may be some thank questions you. later. We could always come back sure. to you. Uh, but now uh, let's uh, talk business with Zen. Zen, uh -huh. what do you have for us? Yeah, so maybe I can, so I'll show this a little bit later. But what I wanted to talk about was the uh, ChatGPT retrieval plugin. Um, and so people are going crazy about ChatGPT and how you can get it to, well, how you can get it to do things that it can't do properly right now. So one of the uh, issues is that it doesn't handle uh, mathematical problems well, first of all, because it's language and it doesn't understand um, math appropriately. So with the uh, release of plugins, you, you could give it a math mode. So like Wolfram Alpha could be the math mode for ChatGPT and that's enabled through a plugin to, to Wolfram Alpha. Um, and then we wrote a, a blog post around this that uh, that we'll post in the um, in the uh, in the description. But this is what the blog post was. Uh, I wanted to cover one particular plugin, uh, which is the one that we developed for uh, for ChatGPT. Uh, and essentially, how this plugin works is quite similar to our generative search functionality, um, except now what happens is, let's say you uh, have Weaviate and you've got a bunch of your own documents. These can be anything from your own textbooks. If you're a student and you want to conduct search over your textbooks and you want ChatGPT to answer questions with respect to those textbooks, or it can be your own like personal company document. It can be your entire enterprise, um, your policy, your HR uh, documents. You can put them into Weaviate and essentially how the retrieval plugin uh, works for ChatGPT is you would just go to ChatGPT as regular to their website you would enable the plugin and then you, uh, you submit a prompt to ChatGPT. And usually what would happen is if you ask a question about um, what days do I get off or how many, uh, how many work from home days do I get, ChatGPT would say, I have no uh, information about your particular scenario. Right? Um, but now what it does instead is it realizes that I have a connected vector database. So I have this sort of uh, memory or this uh, store of relevant information that I should go look at before I tell you I don't have any information. So it's a way to, in the short term, augment the memory of a, uh, a large language model with anything that you find relevant enough to put into the vector database. 
So basically what it will do is before it tells you, yeah, I don't know if you give it a, a very specific prompt, it'll query the vector database. And then the vector database comes back with a relevant document. So it conducts the search and it sends the document to ChatGPT and then it reads through it. And if it finds an answer to your prompt, it'll, it'll uh, send you a customized response. Uh, and so this is super cool because now, uh, similar to the generative search functionality, you can just go into ChatGPT. Uh, well, not now, but when you have access to this. So right now, this is an alpha. Uh, very few limited uh, people have access to this. But when you do get access to it eventually, you can go to ChatGPT. Uh, and I can actually show that component of this. So here, you could go here. And then you won't have access to this right now, so it's in alpha. But you could go down here, and then you would be able to see the uh, VV8 retrieval plugin here. You could simply install it. So these are the only few that are kind of uh, officially accepted at this point. Uh, but we're in the process of going through this as well. So you would install it, and then now you could ask a question, and then it would work on your uh, your own uh, documents. I can show a video of this actually. Uh, as well over here. So this is a video that Sebastian recorded where here he's going in. Yeah, so that's what the retrieval plugin looks like. And so this is a question that only the vector database has information about, ChatGPT doesn't know about. So you can see that it uses the retrieval plugin here and then you can ask it further questions. The, the interesting thing here that I want to point out, let me zoom back up for a second. Notice what it does here. Okay, so you ask it a question and then it uses the plugin and then it uses the plugin again. That's an interesting thing that I wanna talk about uh, a little bit later on, but I'll, I'll let this whole thing complete out. You can have a follow-up conversation with it. So when we created this video, uh, ChatGPT could query Weaviate to get information that it thought was relevant to answering uh, a question. So the what what we have now, which is version two point uh, version two, is that you can actually go and insert documents through a query uh, through writing a prompt, and then also delete documents through writing a prompt. So in this blog post, I mentioned that this would be super cool because you could tell ChatGPT something and you could ask it to remember it for next time or put store it into its vector database memory. And instead of calling the query endpoint, as is shown here, it would just call the upsert endpoint and it would actually insert uh, objects into EV8. You can also call the delete endpoint by telling it to forget something, forget a particular document, or forget that you told it uh, a particular detail, and that would call the delete endpoint, and it would remove objects from Weave8. So it's a you're basically upserting, querying, deleting things just by talking to ChatGPT, which is which is pretty scary, but it's also uh, super cool as well. That's really cool for the example that you gave of like company policy documents. It's like, what if it changes? Yeah, you kind of need to update that, and that's cool that you could just do that within the plugin. Yeah, you don't even have to go to Weaviate to do that. You don't have to like call uh, a particular endpoint. You can ask ChatGPT to call the endpoint for you. Um, digging further into that question, the super interesting thing uh, with ChatGPT and plugins is that you would think that they you ha you tell it how to call the query endpoint or how to query the vector database, um, but that's not actually true. When you uh, when you create the plugin, which if anybody's interested, you can actually see the code. Uh, for the Weave8 um, retrieval plugin over here. But when you create the uh, the plugin, you have to create a manifest. And in that manifest, you have to tell uh, ChatGPT what the endpoints you're exposing are, and you have to describe them. So uh, for our endpoints, we have the query endpoint, which has a description of uh, retrieve objects from uh, your Weave8 uh, vector database. There's an upsert, delete, uh, there's all sorts of endpoints there. We just describe them. Uh, we never actually tell ChatGPT the syntax with which to use those endpoints. So it doesn't really know how to query, but it uses your code and your description of the code, so your comments, to understand how it should query Weave8. Um, and how I realized this was, so if I go back to this video, you see here, 
you see how it tried it first and it didn't work? This is because it's learning how to query the database in real time. So it failed the first time and then it realized, okay, let me try in a different way. And then it realized how to query the database. And then from that point on, every time you query, so now if you ask it another question and if I let it run, you see how it works on the first try? It's because it, it made a mistake, it learned how to query it. And then every time from that point on, it just uses the same syntax to query. So that's something super cool that is not apparent in the uh, in the kind of the face of the blog or the video itself. Um, but you, you can actually communicate it, how to use your plugin and it will use it accordingly, which I thought was, was, was super interesting. Yeah, and if you, if you jump straight to the end, because that would be a shameless plug, by the way, uh, if you go like way, way, way to the end, like you can probably just uh, jump there um, until we, we have the, like the final answer. So yeah, pause here. So FYI, uh, this this actually is factually correct. We are looking for developer advocates uh, to to join Weviate. So uh, this is not made up. Like uh, this is one of the roles we're hiring. So anyone that would like to join, the, you know, this team here, um, hey, we're looking for people. So always always cool. Um, I also thought like uh, of this. Uh, and by the way, like uh, one uh, thing, like a non exact big excuse, but uh, normally would show you this live. Uh, the thing what happened is we like to leave dangerously. Uh, so we're updating the plugin and then sort of broke it a little bit. So that's why we're not showing it live live, because basically right now, if you ask questions, uh, ChatGPT just like uh, gives us an error because we broke the, the current version of the, the test plugin. Uh, yeah, there's but that's a, okay. That's there's okay. a good reason, actually, because I mentioned here, uh, before in version 1.0, we only had the query endpoint that was exposed to ChatGPT. Now we have delete and um, and insert or the upsert endpoint. So you can add it, you can get it to remember and forget things. So um, we'll, we'll have a blog post on that coming out soon. So yeah, look yeah. forward to that. And uh, and we have a question, a couple of questions. So does ChatGPT store data from your documents via the plugin? Uh, by by store data, do you mean update the? Yeah, so let let me interpret this. I, I'm assuming here you mean it can store new information into the vector database via the plugin, and the answer is yes. So the endpoint here, instead of using query, it would use a separate endpoint called the upsert endpoint, and you would tell it. Let's say uh, you've told it that uh, you work for Weva and Weva is looking for a developer uh, advocate role. Um, if you want to tell it the developer advocate role is based out of San Francisco or based out of Silicon Valley. Remember this for me. It will actually upsert it into VV8 for you. That's the super cool thing with version two that we're uh, that we're um, working on right now. Yeah, but but also by the way, like as you see on the, um, that on the on the diagram, there's VV8 instance itself. You also also this is a VV8 instance like that with yeah. the, all the functionality that you would expect. So usually the process would be like, hey, if you have ten thousand documents that you want to drop in, you'd use the usual way, right? Like just just insert the data into VV8, and then ChatGPT will be able to query the database to get its answers, right? But I think this addition is also going like, hey, not only can I do it via API. Uh, like Zen was explaining, like you could do it through, uh, yeah, telling ChatGPT add this object. Um, so cool. I think we all need access now. <laughs> I'm jealous. Well, well, here's the fun part, uh, and then uh, we are planning. So there is this conference, ODSC East, which is uh, in Boston. Uh, I think it's like 9 to 11th of May. And there's going to be a hackathon uh, that will be uh, working with ChatGPT plugins and Weviate. And uh, I think the idea is to have like 10 teams in there. Um, and then the, the, every team will get access to the ChatGPT plugins. So, um, you know, that could be one way to get access, like early access. Um, maybe I can share the link to the hackathon a bit later. Um, we have another question. Uh, so from Brent, so the manifest addresses the concern of allowing editing, deleting of certain classes. Yeah. So you, uh, right now you would have to specify where to add, let's say you have multiple classes, you would have to specify which class to add it into. Um, and so the manifest has that particular syntax, but in your, uh, in your talk with ChatGPT, you would have to specify those details as well. Nice, nice. And uh, we get some encouragement now. So like, uh, hey, we all break code half the time. Um, 
That is so true. That is so true. Um, although when I was younger and I, was, I, I thought I was like, I'm such a great engineer, like I never write tests, I just write good code. Uh, <laughs> such a bullshit, like uh, I was so full of, I don't want to say what. <laughs> but yes, we've all done that uh, many times in our lives. So it's cool. And then another word of encouragement from Manami. Manami. Uh, please continue open source effort. You're doing the entire world a favor. Um, that's so nice. Thank you, Manami. Cool. Any more questions, ideas? Oh, uh, one more thing, I guess. Um, so a, a lot of people were super interested in plugins. So right now we're looking at how, um, w w kind of showing you the story underneath how we created this plugin. And the reason why we want to do that is so that, because the process is quite general, if you wanted to create a plugin once you did get access, you would go through similar steps. You would just have different endpoints and you would describe to ChatGPT how to use those endpoints. So if you had, let's say, a, uh, a Pizza Hut endpoint and you wanted to order from Pizza Hut specifically, you would describe the endpoints differently and everything else would be quite similar. So you could, you could uh, you know, create your own endpoint and you can tell that I'm hungry from my example. I can always tell uh, when you're hungry. That's fine. I don't need, I don't, I don't need AI for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. And then I have one more question from FS. How can I add documents as ChatGPT user to the database? Yeah. So you would uh, first, there's uh, two ways. You could just hook up to your WeVA instance. And as Sebastian says, uh, upload the documents um, as, as you would regularly. So that would be in not through ChatGPT. So you would just insert documents here so that your instance knew about them. The second way is uh, you could tell ChatGPT to upsert a document or to remember a document, and it would call the uh, upsert endpoint. So this is version 1.0 in the flowchart, but in version 2.0, there will be another endpoint that it can call, and it can insert documents one at a time for you. Um, so the difference there would be, like Sebastian said, if you're inserting 10,000, 100,000, a million objects, you wouldn't tell ChatGPT to insert it one by one. You would actually have to go through WeVA and then batch them and loop through it and uh, insert it. That would be much more efficient. But if you're having a chat with ChatGPT and you, you say, here's a new detail, insert it, that would be a, a much more easier way to upsert through ChatGPT. Yeah. I think the uh, upserting through ChatGPT, what I could see is like, let's say, uh, like we show, we show this example of the, the, the company policies and the roles. And then like, yes, he, our uh, people and culture person, she could go like, hey, the policy now changed. Now we have additional benefits. Mm -hmm. So she could kind of go like, hey, ChatGPT, now the benefits for the companies are blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then I think that could be like a really good use case. But yeah, in general, like, yeah, there'll be a lot of copy pasting if you want to use yeah. the main ChatGPT as like the way to insert. Uh, not to say expensive because also, I think that every interaction, there's some sort of clicks and tokens that are involved. So um, for efficiency, I would say like of, of like uploading loads of documents, just go straight to Weviate. Um, we like the database is so efficient at it and really good at it. Like that's probably the best way in. Perfect. This is this is great. I love uh, I love the conversation uh, and everything. Like uh, Vera, what do you think? Exciting stuff. Would you use that? Uh, yes, lots of new knowledge for me in that area. So um, the plan is that probably I will start, you know, <laughs> using it or learning more about that. Nice, nice. Yeah, it's always cool to uh, come and learn here. So I'm so happy you're here. That's so cool. Cool. Okay. So last but not least, uh, like I mentioned early, um, Erica is already getting excited. So uh, <laughs> tell us, what do you have for us, Erica? All right, um, I'll be covering AutoGPT and how you can use it with Weviate. Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing my screen. I don't mind at all. all right. uh, so yesterday, GP and I released a blog post on AutoGPT and how you can use it with Weviate. Um, I want to touch on this image here. I really love how it's, well, I guess I should first explain what AutoGPT is. Um, so what it does is it leverages uh, GPT-4 and 3.5 to chain together different thoughts and complete tasks autonomously. Um, so in this figure, 
I don't know if you can see my mouse, yeah. Um, we have three people and they look like they're kind of like debating something, right? And then they have like these different workflows. So that's kind of what AutoGPT is. It's like uh, you give it a task and now it's going to kind of create subtasks in order to complete that objective. And it kind of just like works within itself to do this, um, which is very cool. Um, so what makes this different from um, ChatGPT is that with ChatGPT, you have to prompt it, right? So you are querying or chatting with ChatGPT like one by one, and then you're refining the prompts. So prompt engineering is a thing that has emerged from this. Um, but with AutoGPT, like I said, you just give it a task like order me pizza. And it's like, okay, I need to find like local pizza stores nearby, um, figure out like what I've ordered in the past to see if I like cheese or pepperoni. And then it's going to, I guess it has the knowledge of my address and it's gonna please do it and deliver it. Um, so that's a really cool thing. Also, I wanna point out that it has gotten a lot of attention. I mean, I'm sure I'm like preaching to the choir, but it jumped from 20,000 to 80,000 stars in a matter of days. And I, we broke this Monday and released it yesterday. And right now it is at 93, where do I say, right here, 93, almost 94,000. So it's growing quickly. Oh my God. And there you go, <laughs> look at it. And you can see it uh, jumping up like an insane amount. Anyway, so that's a little bit about what it is and how it differs from uh, ChatGPT. And then the capabilities, I included a few examples um, from Twitter. Um, so Sully shared a thread on using it to conduct market research. I guess I can just show it. Um, so here it has, it's defining these different goals and then it kind of is going through the steps in order to do this. Then we have Varun um, pointed out that um, AutoGPT was tasked with uh, creating an application. And then it realized that, sorry, wrong one. <laughs> it realized that he didn't have a, uh, he didn't have Node installed on his computer. So AutoGPT took it upon itself to find a Stack Overflow link and it installed Node by itself, which is kind of creepy um, that it can do all of these tasks with your computer autonomously. Because think about like what you have on your laptop. I don't know if it, you want it to be able to write things to your computer. So that's something to be aware of. And then lastly, um, Shubham has a thread or a video actually, which is really cool, of ChatGPT ordering pizza. This is an example. You have it right here. It's actually a Chrome extension. That you, they have a wait list. I think it's hyperwrite AI. Um, so yeah, AutoGPT is ordering pizza from Domino's and delivering it to the house, which is amazing. Um, and then how to use it with VB8. So there is a, this is a code base um, on how it is integrated with VB8, but it's actually super simple. You can start off with creating a WCS instance. And this is what Vera touched on earlier. Um, so it's very easy to create a sandbox. And then you, uh, during installation, you want to edit these variables. Um, so we have the memory backend. So you just want to change um, from local. And then you have the endpoint, which is the URL that you have when you create your sandbox. Um, and then two other, the protocol, and then also the API key, which Vera also touched on. So thanks for doing that. <laughs> um, and then, or you can also run it um, within a Docker container. So it's very cool and easy to run. And I shared like quite a few examples. I'm curious to see like how people are using it along with VB8. Um, I guess I also didn't touch on it, but what, why it needs to, or why it can be um, integrated with VB8 is because it gives it a short-term and long-term memory. So the short-term aspect is it's able to store its actions within your database, but then on the long-term aspect, um, it's able to remember or access um, the data that is in your database. Um, so like one example, I think I gave somewhere in here very quickly is if you have a customer base in Boston and you want to um, create, an, if, and you want AutoGPT to create an ad from it, um, it's important like in Boston, we love Dunkin' Donuts. So maybe you wanna like task AutoGPT with for framing your ad along around um, Dunkin' Donuts or like the Boston Marathon was two days ago. So it just has that like long-term memory of what's in your database. And then also it's able to store its actions so you're not calling the API multiple times. And then lastly, which is very important, is to proceed with caution. 
um, because it has access to your OpenAI API key and you don't want it to run up <laughs> the cost. Um, so maybe kind of set a limit on there before playing with this. And then also, like I mentioned earlier, it can install things on your laptop. So maybe just be careful of that and keep a close eye on uh, what it's doing. And again, the um, GitHub repo is in the description, I believe. Uh, so you can check it out. And then if you want to see where it is, uh, where Weebee is, go to the auto GPT and then you click on memory. And here we have Weebee, the best one. So yeah, and that's all. <laughs> of course it's the best one, of course. I love, it. I love how you whispered it. That was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, nobody here doubts that, that's for sure. No. <laughs> nice. This is this is excellent. But this has been also like I've been reading like that. It's not always like uh, uh, like super rosy because like sometimes also like the auto GPT may get things wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Or like uh, do you, do you know much about that? Uh, well, when we talked about it yesterday, you were kind of laughing that sometimes it will just find a reason to not complete the task. So it will just go in a loop. And it, so that's why it's important to watch it to see what's happening, <laughs> to see if it's making yeah, any progress. Uh, and maybe that's when you kind of refine the prompts, a little bit of prompt engineering in that aspect. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like sometimes, um, yeah, like um, AutoGPT is like this, like super eager PhD student. Like uh, it's always super eager to learn more and then dig deeper and deeper and never gets to that like, hey, now it's time to write my thesis, you know, uh, or dissertation. It's like, no, 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 I need to do more research. Uh, yeah, five years later, it's like, hey, where is the, the thesis? I was like, no, 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 I'm doing research. I was like, I only ordered a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> it is so funny. That's so funny. And uh Kind of says it's awesome. I agree. I agree. Excellent. Questions, thoughts, anyone? Auto GPT seems kind of like uh, I was having trouble understanding the difference between Auto GPT and the idea behind Chat GPT plugins. Um, it just, uh, while you were talking, it kind of uh, came to me that Auto GPT is kind of like a a jailbreak version of plugins, no? Because um, right now people don't have access to plugins, but people can develop their own um, Chrome extensions that are essentially what plugins would be. And you could give uh, ChatGPT through the use of APIs access to those plugins, to the ability to write to your computer, the ability to access your browser, uh, which is what there's a browser plugin there's a vector database plugin. All of these exist as plugins, but uh, people have found a way to get around that, and AutoGPT does that same thing. Yeah. I, I think that some difference. Uh, so, sorry, Erica. It, it could be um, with the plugins you often de develop them with purpose, right? So you could have a plugin that's like, hey, a plugin that orders pizza, or or, or more seriously, like, hey, plugin that orders a hotel and a flight for me and organizes my trip. And those are like. Uh, stuff that are implemented with humans intention right but i think in this case uh it's like hey i don't know how to order a pizza right like you have this auto gpt thing or even like this uh example erica user was like um hey uh, i want to build this application and this thing goes and figures out that it needs notes learns and finds that what's the instruction and then downloads whatever it's needed right so i think the difference is one like plugins are intentional with like a very specific task and they're well defined uh like the weavid retrieval plugin there's a specific thing like uh, uh nothing it, it didn't have to learn how to build weavid right while while auto gpt is like hey yeah let me figure it out for you that's why the, the research part is there right like uh five years to order a pizza I, I don't think it happens five years but i, I was just making a bad joke yeah so yeah. it builds that chain of thought almost and then so it, it knows what to do in step one two and three and then it's got the extensions and all of these tools that allow it to enact step two, three, four, and then get the job done. Yeah. 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 Cool. And so, so but I love the comparison of yeah, the plugins versus AutoGPT, but I don't know if I can share my screen. I didn't. Yeah, of course. Within the repository. So it does have internet access for searches, which is what we're talking about. Like kind of, you know, it has um, access to Stack Overflow, for example, and then the long-term short-term memory also, um, 
it uses GPT-4 for text generation, and then it has, um, and it also uses uh, GPT-3.5 for file storage and summarization. So it has like quite a few features that you can use, and then you kind of like chain them together, you know, in order to complete an assignment <laughs> or a task. Nice, nice. I'll stop sharing my screen. <laughs> cool, Could I cool. give it my code and get it to debug it for me? Yes. What? <laughs> Why would you want to uh, auto GPT to cry? <laughs> it's a yeah, easy task for it. <laughs> no, I, I think that's part of the game. Yeah. So we have a question from the audience. Um, so it's awesome. So yeah, Langchain is a jailbroken version of auto GPT. Here's a question for you. What's the difference between the potential here and full blown AGI? Ooh, I actually don't even think they're is a difference between the two. I mean, if you think about it in a sense, I mean, with AutoGPT, it's like one agent, I believe. It's not like our image of having the three separate agents. I think that could be interesting. Like with full-blown AGI, I think it's like these agents are communicating with each other to complete the task. Whereas AutoGPT, I believe, is doing it by itself and it's going like a step-by-step, -step, in a step-by-step -step manner. Um, whereas with full-blown AGI and multiple agents. It's kind of like chatting with each other to complete it in silo, and then somehow maybe comes together to join work. Um, that'd be my take on it. I mean, kind of, I've seen a lot of, a few um, papers and also Twitter threads about like full-blown AGI, these agents working together, and it's kind of really cool. So. Baby AGI. <laughs> Baby AGI, that's another thing. I mean, the speed up, which everything is coming out like built off of GPT-4 is insane. It's really cool to see them, and everything will be integrated with V8. <laughs> Home automation API is real fun. Oh, like folding laundry, or is possible? <laughs> yeah, this is where it gets dangerous, right? Because if you have a plugin to control your uh, door lock, your automated doorbell, your uh, heating, uh, uh, your AC in your home and it can control that, well, then it's got real world implications. Yeah. Absolutely. There, there's this whole thing, like I was reading this article about how like this specific um, parts of the code where like um, uh, the AI cannot, let's say, set itself free sort of thing. Like uh, there's like certain limits, right? But uh, it could hire a human to then go and hack maybe into like into the thing and then like change and then uh, enable it like to, to let's say release it from the jail. Um, so it's, it's, it's like, it cannot do it by itself, but it can pay a, a person to do it, right? So that, that could be kind of uh, scary. Like what if like, uh, I don't know, Elon Musk had like his own because he's got like a ton of money I'm using as an example. And then he kind of gave access to the account and like suddenly go like, hey, let me share 50% of your uh, Tesla stock and then pay somebody a crazy amount of money to set me free. That would be kind of cool. So yeah, that's the scary thing where like, it's not an AI that is like, oh, giving you answers and everything. It will actually do something in the real world. It's, uh, it's very, far, very far fetched what I said, but it's possible. <laughs> I also saw this talk recently. There was a paper, not a paper, but like just an ex a bunch of experiments that were released by Microsoft called uh, Sparks of AGI. And then one of the writers had a 50 minute talk on this uh, on YouTube. If you just Google Sparks of AGI, you'll find that talk. It's got about like half a million views on it now. Um, but there, one thing he said was quite interesting because a lot of people say that it's just a statistical model and it's trying to understand, it's a language model. It's trying to understand co-occurrence of words and how the co-occurrences uh, co-occur. Um, but one thing he said, which kind of struck with me was, uh, don't underestimate the trillion dimensional, uh, uh, trillion dimensional embedding space. If you've got trillions and trillions of vectors, then why can't it build a, word mo a world model? Why can't it learn all of these things, uh, which is super cool. One of the things, I guess my take on this would be um, right now, it is still just a language model. So um, it doesn't have a good understanding. So he, if you ask a human to solve a, a math problem, you're, he, they're not going to take that math problem as a, a language problem. They're going to use their math mode. They're going to turn on their algebra mode and solve that problem. Whereas um, ChatGPT only has a mathematical model at this point. Like GPT-4 is a is a language model. Um, it doesn't have other modalities of 
reasoning. So it, it um, they added visual search. So now it's got this concept of seeing images and creating images. But I still think that uh, a full-blown AGI needs to have all of these different senses or modalities. So like, um, I don't know, I guess uh, a full-blown AGI uh, would be able to examine something through computer vision, and then maybe it can even smell something. Like all of these different sensory modules that humans have, a full-blown AGI would need to have some sort of digital equivalent of those. And then that's when things would start to get really scary. That's when you have a home robot. <laughs> yeah. The, the argument against that is people argue that like, humans just had language and then they developed all of these other understanding like mathematical understanding from language. So it, it's possible that a large language model could develop all of this just through its language understanding. Um, so that's one argument as well. But I think it would just be easier to tell it that in this case, use the language mode. In this case, use the math mode. In this case, use your physics mode. And that would be kind of a um, more, more progress towards full-blown AGI. There was uh, an experiment of planting ChatGPT into a robot, and uh, it was programmed with GPT-4 and a sarcastic humor personality. So um, the developer would give it commands like, go in a square, and the robot would say, okay, fine, if that's what makes you happy. <laughs> but when things got scary is that um, a developer asked the robot to go fetch me a beer, and uh, the robot says, uh, Hmm. I don't think I can do that, but let me impress you with something else. <laughs> so it, it disobeyed the command. And uh, that can turn more dangerous in the future. My question, do you have to pay for those sarcastic tokens that it's using? Because it's not useful. <laughs> that would suck. <laughs> and something else scary is that OpenAI uh, ran a, a red team test on whether ChatGPT would hire a human. And it succeeded. It, it claimed uh, it was a visually impaired user needing help to solve a capture or something like that. So AI hired a human. One of these marketplaces like Fiverr. That's so funny. Cool, cool. Uh, I have a few more comments from uh, Manami, but I think we're on time, so we won't be necessarily responding to all of it. I think. That might be to my comment or like that there's like a far fetch that maybe um, ChatGPT could like pay someone to set it free. But I guess if it doesn't know about its limits, then it wouldn't pay someone to to take care of it. Um, I, I guess that makes sense. Um, yeah, and it looks like um, it has like ears, like basically the request that it receives is like its ears, etc. So it's kind of cool. Um, some far-fetched ideas, maybe some uh, food for thought. Uh, so using AI to gynecote plants to have predetermined chemical output when exposed to measure external force. Uh, interesting, interesting. Maybe you can unpack it next time round. Um, so basically you could get computers without the need for constant energy consumption. So, um, so like not quantum computing, but maybe uh, nature computing sort of bio like computers. Uh, biocomputers like yeah we haven't seen those in you know with our brains and stuff but yeah it's like what if we could en engineer that that would be kind of cool um and then earlier on like also manami was uh, mentioned that you would like to see more about the uh, lung chain uh, we kind of talked about it last month uh, i believe um and then also we have a pretty cool blog post about it but maybe uh, maybe we could um, have a, another conversation next time around with we Air Aaron and talk about lung chain. Um, but that will take another few weeks until uh, we get back to it probably. So yeah, they uh, do very fast. So I'm sure we'll have something new in a month from now. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, there's so, there's so many things uh, happening. Um, so um, I have to say this was by, go on Erica. Uh, on the lung chain topic, we did add hybrid search to the retriever of lung chain if you would like to check it out. Oh, nice. So keyword searching and vector searching uh, in one go with uh, Langchain. Very nice, very nice. So just to wrap up, thank you all for listening. This was by far the most active uh, comments-wise and question-wise 
uh, session of We Did Air. And then I was super excited to, to see that. Like, it was great to see people from so many different locations. Thank you, Veronica, for joining us from the WCS team. Uh, I'm sure we should invite you again. People love your presentation, so it's great. Uh, and then team Erika, da uh, Dan, Zen, amazing job, as always. Uh, excellent uh, presentations and discussions. And then to all of you that are watching us once more, uh, thank you very much. Uh, see you in our Slacks, in the community events, maybe come to Boston, or see you next month for the next We Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Come on, Vasily. Say bye too. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>